Hello everyone, my name is Yanni and I am a sophomore this year. Today I will be talking about the sport of swimming and hopefully um, we'll tell you if you would like to join it or not and just information about college recruiting. So I think swimming is a great sport. It works almost every single muscle in your body and it makes you mentally tough. So if you love swimming or you feel that you have a talent in swimming, it will definitely help you in your college recruiting and application. So if you choose to swim, there are two different kinds. There's high school swimming and club swimming. So high school swimming, um, the season is about three months long in the fall and you race the local high schools in your area. The highest level you can get to is state champs and finals. A lot of people may ask, how long is the team training for high school? Um, for my high school, we practice Monday through Fridays for two hours in the afternoon, and that is mandatory. And we have drylands in the morning, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for an hour. Also, the dual meets um, that we have during the season, which is between two high schools only, are usually on weekdays after school, but the championship meets like districts and state are during the weekends. If you are faster, you can attend regionals. You have to also have their time standards but regionals is for anyone 18 and under. Since I am in the Pacific Northwest swimming, that will be my example. And if you are in club swimming, there are different levels that you can compete at, starting with local invite meets where um, your local club teams come together to compete. You race with the same people in your age group and everyone can be in these meets, no matter how fast or slow you are. And your first um, meet that will require time standards would be age group champs. And you also race the people in your own age group, but you must achieve the age group time standards to go to a meet like this. And age group is only for 14 and under summers. If, if you are even faster, you can go to the sectionals meet. If you have the qualifying time, you can attend. And if you are 15 and older and you have a sectionals cut, you cannot attend the regionals meet. And even faster, there's zones. And this is a special meet where it, you apply and the coaches have a selection process and if you are selected you are representing the pacific northwest swimming at western zones even faster than that is junior nationals um you must achieve the time standards and this is for anyone 18 and under racing with entire nation and there are two junior national meets a year during the winter and during the summer and going even faster, you can get to nationals where it's open to all age groups. And a lot of Olympic swimmers will even be at these national meets. Uh, and finally, there are the Olympic trials, which happen every four years, uh, right before the Olympics. And you must have their time standards. And if you place well enough at Olympic trials, you will be able to represent the USA at the next Olympics. Um, 如果你的学生没有参加俱乐部的游泳, 而只是参加高中四年的游泳, 
呃，对申请大学没有太大的加分作用。如果他在俱乐部游泳，但成绩一般，参加高中四年的游泳，除非能成为高中的队长，否则对申请大学也没有太大的加分作用。呃，如果在游泳俱乐部成绩相当不错的孩子，情况有些复杂，一般这些孩子的俱乐部教练。不鼓励你参加高中游泳，他们普遍认为高中游泳训练过于简单，会影响俱乐部的训练。呃，我个人的经验是，需要看看每一个人的情况。呃，大学都喜欢他们挑战自己，如果既能游高中，又能游俱乐部，还能保持 GPA four point o 就说明孩子能 handle multitasking。呃，在高中的另一个好处是，大学教练会关注这些高中的游泳比赛。如果高中能游到 state， 并且取得名次，大学教练会很感兴趣。如果再能成为队长，就更好。但是前提是不能影响你的 GPA 和俱乐部的游泳成绩。So the second thing I would like to talk about is college swimming. And depending on the swimming level of the college, there are three different levels: D1, D2, and D3. So obviously, D1 is the best, and schools that are in D1 are Stanford, Berkeley, etc. D2 schools are not as fast as D1 schools, and D3. Is the slowest of the three, but there are still great schools that are D three in swimming, like MIT and University of Chicago. So the third thing is you should know yourself and where you are at, and be prepared early on. So if you are doing pretty well. And you think that swimming might help you in your college recruiting and application, then you should really get ready as soon as possible. And I re- recommend going to www.collegeswimming.com. So you can go onto their website and register for a free account. The third step. Would to be go under the find a college tab, and you can add the colleges that you're interested to your list. The second step would be to go under the times tab, and you can put in all of your best times, and focusing on your short course yard times, because this is, um. For college, and they only swim in short course yards. So once you have all your schools added, you can see all of them at the same time, and you would be able to see if they're D one, D two, or D three. And they're also、um, split into N A I A, N G, N J C A A, C C C A A, which are different associations, and different schools may be in different associations. And you can click on any school, and under it will be how do I fit. After you click on that, you can see how you are ranked in all of the people、um, in your graduating class for that school. This website also has lots of other useful tools that you can use.、Um, you can. Just find out overall how you place in the recruiting of your graduating class, and obviously this will change as people improve over the years. Um, but it will give you a somewhat idea of how you are placing. So for schools that are in D one, like Stanford and the Ivy League schools, um, I feel like you would have to be at the level of junior nationals. To really have a good shot at getting into these schools, but if you're only at the sectionals or zones level, you don't need to worry. But because you can also get into D three schools like MIT, 
there's a really good chance that you could get into those schools. So the fourth thing that I, I would like to talk about is recruiting. So um, after you know about the schools and everything, you can start the recruiting process. Um, so you can find a school that you are interested in and recruit. Um, the earliest I would suggest to do this would be during your sophomore year. NCAA has rules that the college coaches are not allowed to contact you until September 1st of your junior year. Um, but this doesn't mean that you can't contact them. You can call or email the head coach, update them with your new best times, and this will definitely show that you are interested in that college. To be prepared for the recruiting process, you should have um, the address and phone numbers for you, your high school, your high school coach, um, your club, all your best times, your GPA, and some of the colleges that you are interested in. So I'll have UCLA as an example, and I'll guide you through how to um, get the recruiting process started. So you would go to their website, ucla.edu. You would have to go under athletic and find recruits. Under recruits, there should be recruiting questionnaire and go ahead and click on that. And then you would obviously choose women swimming and diving or men swimming and diving. So all of the colleges have different recruiting questionnaires, but they all cover about the same information. And then finally, the recruiting questionnaire will pop up asking for all kinds of information. So go ahead and fill that out, send it in, and you will be done with that school. Um, many schools will email you right after you send in your recruiting questionnaire. Um, many of them are automatic sendbacks from the head coach's email. So for example, if you sent your recruiting questionnaire into Stanford, you might get an email that says, thank you for your interest in Stanford women swimming. At this time, NCAA rules prohibit us from contacting you via mail until September 1st of your junior year. However, NCAA rules do allow you to call us at any time if you wish to do so. Our contact information can be found at blank. Best of luck in the recruiting process. And just like that, you filled out a question, recruiting questionnaire and the college now has your information and they will contact you as soon as they are allowed to. And you can email them anytime with your new times and this is just a really good start. And if you are a really, really great, outstanding swimmer, the last step I would suggest would be to attend some great national teams or anything like that. You can check out the following websites to learn more. Um, that concludes my swimming information. Thank you for listening and have a great night. Thank you. Hello everyone. My name is Stephen Liang. I am a junior and I live in New Jersey. But today I'll be talking about the University of Pennsylvania. The University of Pennsylvania, often referred to as Penn or UPenn, is a private Ivy League research university located in Philadelphia. For testing requirements, UPenn requires the ACT or SAT, as well as the TOEFL for international applicants. 
UPenn does not do score choice, meaning that it will, it will require applicants to send their entire testing history for the SAT and ACT. UPenn does not give preference to either, but it will super score the SAT, meaning that it will take the highest individual reading, math, and writing section scores across all test settings and combine them for super store, super score, which it does not do for the ACT. UPenn also recommends, but does not require, two SAT subject tests. It also has recommended tests for specific areas of study. For instance, applicants for nursing should take a science, preferably chemistry, subject test. Applicants for science, tech, engineering, and math should take the math level two and a science test, preferably physics for engineering applicants. Business applicants are recommended to take the math level two test. For the average SAT scores and GPA, the average SAT is, the, is a 2163 with a 710 in reading, 728 in math, and 725 in writing. The 75th percentile gets a 2320 with a 760 in reading and a 780 in both math and writing. The average GPA is a 3.9. When it comes to AP and pre-college credit, there's not much information for what UPenn requires, but UPenn will award credit or advanced course standing to students who have taken specific AP or IB exams. However, this varies by department, and UPenn does not give credit for all AP exams, even if students have gotten a five on them. For teacher recommendations, UPenn requires two, ideally from teachers who have taught in the major subjects, math, science, social science, English, or foreign language in the junior or senior year. UPenn also recommends getting a recommendation from a teacher in the, your area of academic interest and that you get letters from different subjects. For example, a letter from a math teacher and an English teacher rather than two letters from different in math teachers. UPenn also allows for only one supplemental optional recommendation letter. UPenn is composed of four main schools, the College of Arts and Sciences, the School of Nursing, Penn Engineering, and Wharton. All applicants must choose from one of the four undergrad schools or specialized programs, which will be where they focus in, although they can take classes in all four. Each school has different recommendations and preferred traits for its students. For instance, the College of Arts and Sciences wants applicants who are into the humanities, social sciences, and natural sciences. The School for Nursing prefers applicants who are committed to caring for patients in healthcare and who have taken many science courses, particularly in chemistry. Penn Engineering wants applicants who can innovate, design, solve problems, and apply scientific discoveries. It also requires that they have taken mathematics courses, particularly calculus. Applicants applying for Wharton should have an interest in business and advancing the world's economy and society. They must, have, they must also have leadership and a strong preparation in mathematics, especially calculus. As with many other colleges, UPenn requires applicants to complete a personal essay, as well as a unique pen writing supplement. The purpose of these is to show the college more about the applicants, how they think, what they value, and how they see the world. UPenn feels that the applicants' test scores and transcripts are the numbers and show the type of students they are, so that their essays show what type of people they are and what they bring to the college community. Students who apply to UPenn must submit their application to one of the four main undergrad schools. For the Penn Writing Supplement, they must specifically address why they are applying to Penn and why they are applying to that undergrad school. As for admission statistics, there were around 37,000 37, total applicants for the class of 2019, and 3,700, or 10% of the total applicants were admitted. There were 5,500 early decision applicants, and around 1,300, or 24% of those applicants, were admitted. As for extracurricular activities, UPenn believes that the students pursues out of the classroom give their admissions committee insight into his or her passions and responsibilities. It wants students to be themselves and let their involvement in other activities reflect their own personal interests, not necessarily their majors or academic paths. In general, for extracurricular activities, you need a, general pa a genuine passion for something to get in. For UPenn and many other similar top colleges, passion is more about quality than about quantity. UPenn has a 
multiple pre-college programs, the first being Penn Summer High School program. It offers this to both residential and commuting students. And the programs revolve around courses that are taught by faculty, scholars, and outside experts. Classes are small, giving each student individualized attention. In addition, residents get extra programs that include, that are mainly revolve around extracurricular activities such as SAT prep, college writing, and college admission preparations. Their presentation, sorry. There is also summer, uh, summer academies program, which are non-credit programs for both residential and commuting high school students, and mainly in biomedical, chemistry, experimental physics, and social justice. UPenn also allows high school students to take undergrad courses over the summer and receive credit. Now for graduation rate, the overall aggregate undergrad graduation rate is 96%. Now for the analysis of the major schools I'm interested in, Penn Engineering and Wharton. So for Penn Engineering overall, it seems to be about as tough as any other Ivy Engineering school, not except for MIT and Caltech. Nonetheless, it still requires a lot of work, especially and is likely much more work than what most high school students are used to. Now for the majors, they're primarily in engineering and applied sciences. There are two main branches in bachelor degrees, the Bachelor of Science and Engineering and the Black Bachelor of Applied Science. Now for Wharton, Wharton is probably one of the hardest schools not only to get into, but also to stay in and to maintain a high GPA. There are some who say that the school is very cutthroat and has a hard harsh graving, grading curve, while others, maintain, while others maintain that the curve helps grades is not more competitive than any other Ivy school, such as Harvard. In terms of majors, all students graduate with a Bachelor of Science and Economics from Wharton, but they choose focused areas of study that are called concentrations, which are much, very similar to majors. However, unlike majors, concentrations are much more flexible and it's much easier to do multiple ones. Now, for life at Penn. UPenn is a diverse community full of artistic expression, civil outreach, student activism, and Ivy League athletics. It is in the West Philadelphia region, which means it's full of opportunities for internships and civil engagements. UPenn offers many ways for students to determine what they like and meet with peers with both similar and different interests. The variety of social, political, religious, and cultural activities on campus also enriches the life there. UPenn has a variety of housing and dining options, both on and off campus, allowing all members of its community to find the right choice for them. There are off-campus services that provide resources for finding off-campus housing for students, including a list of short-term housing near campus. In addition, Penn's college houses provide residential areas for undergrad students, and nearby hotels often give special rates for people visiting UPenn. Penn also has a lot of dining options. Penn Dining delivers food and oversees 10 dining locations across the campus, including cafes, markets, and grocers. Penn also has food vending with over 90 trucks, carts, and tables on campus that sell varieties of food. Now, for jobs and salary after UPenn. For alumni who have only re received a bachelor's degree, the average starting salary for alumni with zero to five years of experience is around 60300 the mid-career salary for alumni with 10 plus years experience is around 120,000, which places UPenn at 10th place in comparison with the other colleges. However, unlike most high-ranking schools, only 19% of the alumni have been awarded a STEM degree. Now for all alumni, including ones who have reached higher than a uh, bachelor's degree, UPenn ranks 13th with a starting salary of about 62,000 and a middle salary of around 124,000. Now for Penn Engineering, UPenn has an average salary of 70,100, which places it at sixth. Similarly, Wharton's undergrad starting salary is one of the highest in the world. The average starting salary of the class of 2014 was around 69,500, with an average sign-on bonus of around 9,500 and a year-end bonus of around 29,200. 81% were reported to get sign-on bonuses and 84% got year-end bonuses. In addition, 91% were employed less than three months after graduating. Well, this concludes my presentation on the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you for listening and have a good night. 
Hi, my name is Athena Zhang, and I'm a senior in high school. Today, I'll be talking to you about why you should start your path with a marketing major. First off, what is a marketing major? Well, a marketing major will teach you how to attract customers and promote products and services. Some other people will move on from their undergrad to uh, transfer those credits to a related major, which uh, there are like a lot of diverse majors from a market, which include accounting, advertising, business, communications, entrepreneur studies, uh, finance, and a lot of different uh, fields. I'm sorry, number 10 is the University of South California. You'll probably be wondering if this is right for you. Well, a lot of people that get a marketing major have to be good at teamwork, problem solving, and have lots of creativity. This is also very ideal for people that may not really know what they want to do in the future and they're a little bit unsure because the marketing major has a lot of diverse jobs and unlimited career opportunities. The marketing field also has a lot of potential these last few years with it growing exponentially. So if you get a marketing major and pursue a job in the marketing field, you will have a lot of future growth. So a lot of the coursework in a marketing major focuses on advertising, merchandising, promotion, statistical analysis, and mathematics. Some helpful high school courses you can take in preparation for this major are statistic, AP Calc, AB, um, AP Calc, sorry, B, AB, English, computer applications, business, AP psychology, AP micro, and macro. Some people pursue an associate's degree, and the prerequisites are a high school diploma or SAT or ACT test scores. And for those who are very um, not sure what an associate's degree is, it's a degree that you can only t you take only two years to study. Some people will also do an undergrad, which takes four years of study, which you would need a high school diploma or equivalent for an undergrad admissions. And with an undergrad, grad, you would be learning about the fundamental marketing concepts. With a graduate's degree, you would have to get a bachelor's degree for graduate's mission, and you'd be getting an in-depth understanding of consumer behavior, branding, analytics for marketing, and methods of promotion. So the top 10 marketing schools, according to U.S. News for undergrad, are number one, University of Michigan Ann Arbor. Uh, in a close tie is the University of Pennsylvania, number three, University of Texas, Austin, number four, Indiana University, Bloomington, number five, University of California, Berkeley, number six, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, number seven, New York University, number eight, University of Virginia, number nine, University of Wisconsin, Madison, and number 10, University of South Carolina. For graduate marketing schools, number one is Northwestern University, number two is the University of Pennsylvania, number three, Stanford, number four, Harvard, five, Duke University, six, University of Michigan Ann Arbor, seven, Columbia University, eight, University of Chicago, nine, University of New York University, ten, University of California, Berkeley, and in a notable mention, University of Texas Austin. So going back to the career opportunities that a marketing major would provide uh, include um, art directors, which make around um, 97K, a sales worker supervisor, a public relations specialist, uh, which make around 64K, um, a business operations specialist, a marketing research analysis, analysis, which is um, around 69K and a marketing manager, which is around 127K. So a lot of, uh, so according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, 
the mark um marketing research analysis will be seeing probably a average a faster than average increase of 32 percent increase in demand over the next decade and marketing managers will expect around a job growth of 12 percent thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me um if you would like to look at this um, more in depth, you can look at the Prezi that I've linked above. Uh, if you have any questions, you can comment down below and ask them to me or personally. Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Mina Wang, and I am a senior at Saratoga High School. And today I'm going to be presenting to you about Princeton University. So I had the opportunity to visit Princeton this summer um, and it's located in New Jersey and I went on their campus tour. So I'll have some insight about um, what their tour guide said as well as the information session. I would like to start off and say that their website is actually really informative. So if I miss anything, they have a lot of the information there. So Princeton is located in a pretty quiet environment and it's very peaceful. It resembles part of a forest and, um, and it's very clean. In my opinion, I think it's actually, it's in a very safe place and they also have a blue light system on their campus to ensure safety. Basically, if you feel that you are in any danger, you go to a blue light and you press it and someone will come help you immediately. The campus tours are led by current students and the information sessions are led by the faculty. So I was able to listen to different perspectives on the school, but also online there are virtual tours and there are very clear pictures in case you cannot visit the campus. Um, in addition to the concentration and certificates, there are many opportunities on the campus, including um, Division I sports, and there are many music and art departments that are available. Now I'm going to be talking about the application um, process. So to start off, Princeton has very small class sizes relatively, and there are usually around 25 students per class, but sometimes there are 100 people for, um, for fundamental classes such as physics or the, um, one of the easier calculus classes. Princeton ha has majors which they call concentrations and minors which they call certificates. You cannot have more than one concentration, but you can have as many certificates as you want, as long as you think you can handle it. And having both a concentration and certificate is very common. Classes are divided into three types. So there are the required classes that everyone has to take, concentration classes that only apply to you, and electives, which are classes that you can take regardless of what concentration you have. Princeton believes in the wide exposure to all topics. So when you apply to Princeton, you actually apply to their general school and not any of their specific colleges because the first year or two, everyone takes about the same classes and you don't declare your major until the first, uh, until the end of the first year or the end of the second year if you think you need more time. Something special that I learned about Princeton is that they have um, research and writing assignments all four years. So freshman year, you have a mandatory writing class that exposes you to different research um, techniques. In junior year, there is a junior thesis, which is 30 to 40 pages, and there's a senior thesis, which is um, a research about something related to your concentration, but you have a wide variety of topics available and you can talk to your faculty that's involved in your guidance and you can uh, choose any topic you want, basically. 
In addition, there are many student run programs on campus that can be found. And if you cannot find the club that you like, you can make one yourself as long as you have five friends to sign up with you and you can go to a faculty member and get it approved. So first you need two teacher recommendation letters from two different area of studies. So for example, um, one from math and one from language arts. The second thing is they want your mid-year school report on top of your transcript. So they want all your grades and the first semester of 12th grade. In terms of testing, both SAT and ACT are accepted and subject tests are recommended but not required. Well, strongly recommended. So if you've taken subject tests, you should submit them. Um, both SAT and ACT, Princeton um, accepts super score, which means it is the highest score from each category combined. In terms of classes taken in high school, there are no fixed unit or course prerequisites because not all high schools offer the same opportunities, but they encourage you to take the most advanced courses available in your school in order to prepare for the similar workload at Princeton. So that means if you have honors or APs, they recommend that you take it. Now I'll be talking about the living conditions at Princeton. Basically 99% of students are fully residential all four years because they have dorms guaranteed for everyone. It is encouraged by Princeton. It is encouraged by Princeton to submit supplemental materials. So for example, if you have any creative writing, dance, music, theater, or visual arts, that you've been um, involved in very much in your life, they would like to see it. And um, the instructions for that are on the website, so I won't go into detail, but if you want me to, you can private message me later. Princeton accepts the applications through either Common App or Universal College application. And there are two choices for applying. So either single choice early action, which means you can only apply to one school early, but you don't have to decide until May 1st. In terms of single choice early action, there are three possible answers that you can get back from them. So it's either you get admitted, deferred, which is um, usually more common than getting rejected, and which means they will reconsider you again in March during regular decision. Statistically speaking, um, in terms of the difference between single choice and regular decision, Single choice has a 9% admission rate, but also people who are applying usually have stronger profiles or are really, really passionate about Princeton. So you might want to caution about that, but regular decision has about 6.8% admission or just around seven. In terms of the difference between due dates, the single choice early action application is due November 1st while the regular decision deadline is due January 1st. And um, any applications for financial aid will be due February 1st. Usually during applications, they ask whether or not you want to apply to liberal arts or engineering school, but you can definitely put undecided if you are not sure. But usually they just want to know to make a rough estimate of what classes they need to prepare for in the future, but you are not bound to the decision that you put on your application. So from what I heard in the information session at Princeton, they look for all different types of students and they want a variety of people in their coming class. So basically there's no set formula into how to get into Princeton, but basically just try your hardest um, and they're looking for passion and curiosity and not just test scores. There are six residential college dorms and basically this is like your smaller community within the school and it'll become your family. But they're randomly assigned and um, they assign it so that there are mixed backgrounds between the people. Each residential college has a residential director and different faculty members. 
So you will always have someone to go to for advice, whether it's academic or personal. Upper class housing is available after the second year and basically the upperclassmen get to move to residential colleges with more space and they also have more options in terms of eating. At Princeton, there are eating clubs, which 70% of the people are involved in. There are also other clubs. For example, there is a co-op cooking club in which people take turns buying groceries and cooking for everyone in their club. The transportation to cities near Princeton are very convenient and they have transit buses all throughout the campus for both um, driving through the campus to different parts of it or to the city and it's very close to New York it's only a few hours so there are many internship opportunities there that you can go to. A special type of program that they offer is the bridge year program which basically after you apply to Princeton your senior year, you have a year to explore the world and they give you opportunities in which you can go to different countries and do community service. Princeton also has a job search program that helps you get internships and job opportunities. So they make sure that you can find work and get experience. Sorry, I meant four years of college. Um, and I just want to emphasize the fact that the faculty ratio is very good. There's about a six to one student to faculty ratio, which means everyone is being fully supported through their entire four years of high school by people with experience. So that is all the information that I have for now about Princeton. Thank you for listening to me. And if you have any additional questions, please either check the website or message me and I will provide you with answers. Thank you, good night everyone. In addition, they really emphasize and prioritize the undergraduates at Princeton. So the faculty members help them more and the classes are taught all by professors and not graduate students. What is comic drawing? Comic drawing is a telling of a story through the use of visual representations and speech. They can make us laugh, they can make us cry, they can make us think, they can make us scream, and they can make us think, what just happened? Hello everyone, today I'm going to give you a presentation on comic drawing. I am Scott. Now, what is comic drawing? Comic drawing is the telling of a story through the use of words and visual representations. They can make us laugh, they can make us cry, they can make us think. Now, comic drawing usually includes one or more panel. The traditional newspaper comic includes four panels, while uh, longer comics, like a graphic novel, includes more than one page of comic panels. However, despite the difference in panel quantity, there's one thing that both share in common, the use of speech bubble. Sound effects and graphic images to convey the story. Now, there are certain liberal arts colleges, colleges with a major emphasis on arts, where you could go to to work to improve on your comic skills. One of these colleges is the Ringling College of Art and Designs, and they have one of the best computer animation programs, which in Then there's the California College of Arts. Visual portfolio for application can include work in a comic medium. Also, and then finally, there's a Minneapolis College of Art and Design, which offers a major in comics. 
Now, in one, now for careers in comic arts, one of the most obvious, obvious needs is a cartoonist. But this is not the old ages. And nowadays, people instead they go online to draw web comics. Web comics can be profitable if it hits big. For Here's a strategy I recommend though. Tell your web comic to a friend and hope that they share with other friends. We eventually share it with other friends. For example, successful web comics include XKCD and Cyanide and Happiness. However, it is a challenge to strike it big online for the internet is a very big place. And your webcomic is going to be one of those scattered all over the. Think web card comics that are too risky? Then take a job as a storyboard nailed artist. Artist who plans. For example, say Tex Jones. He was, he was an old times animator, but that's not beside the point. He drew his own storyboard, and. And since then, he has been known as Despite digital animation, storyboard artists are still as important as ever. Storyboard, drawing storyboard comics can be fun, but most storyboard artists are usually unknown unless they are the animator. Like Tex Joe Avery, who drew Now, how to draw a comic? Well, first, you must start with an idea. Try a fresh new idea, or not something that no one has ever tried. And then, plan out a story. Like, where would it go? Why, why exactly would the, character, the main character... And then, draw the pictures. If you cannot draw... Draw it in any style you want, whether it be American mainstream or maybe the manga style. If there's something you do not know how to draw, then practice. Practice, practice, practice. Practice makes perfect. And now, I hope my presentation will rile up your hope of becoming a cartoonist. Pursue your dreams. Make your dreams. To answer some questions, well, for comics, you need to get a degree in art and design. And for that other question, there are inter an international manga contest hosted by Shoujo Jump. Shonen Jump. Thank you for listening. This is Scott O'Yan, aspiring cartoonist. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Hi, everyone. My name is Ani, and I'm a junior at Gunn High School. Tonight, I'll be talking about Brown University, one of the eight Ivy League schools. I'm sure most of you have at least heard about Brown and know a little bit, a little bit about its prestige. Brown University is currently the number 16th top university in the United States, according to U.S. News. Tonight, I'll be talking a little bit about how to apply to Brown, but I'll also be focusing more on Brown's social atmosphere and its educational and learning environment. Like most colleges, Brown accepts the Common Application, which can be found at commonapplication.org. Brown has two rounds of applications, early decision and regular decision. One of the benefits of applying early is that the acceptance rate for early decision is much higher at 20.6% 20, 20 compared to 7.5% in the regular decision round. The, the deadlines for early decision round and regular decision round are pretty standard. The deadline for early decision applications is November 1st, and the deadline for regular decision applications is January 1st. Besides the common application form, the um, Brown also requires standardized testing scores, of course. So students have a choice between the SAT and two SAT2 scores. And or they can take the ACT with writing 
as strongly recommended. As far as recommendation letters go, Brown, requ Brown requires two recommendation letters, and they recommend that they come from major academic subjects. So that includes English, social studies or history, math, science, and a foreign language. If your student is applying for a Bachelor of Science degree, Brown strongly recommends that one of, at least one of the recommendations comes from a math or science teacher. Now, other than the common application, Brown also has a supplemental form that includes um, about seven short answer responses. These short answer responses range in word count from 25 to 350, and they cover questions like, why Brown and why are you going to college? So that's something to keep in mind when applying. So this summer, I had the chance to really experience the Brown life. I was at Brown for two weeks taking a course called Dissecting History Through Biology with Professor Conant and Professor Schorl. During those two weeks, I learned a lot about the social and learning atmosphere at Brown. So that's what I'll be covering now. On the supplemental form, Brown students are also, or aspiring Brown students are also required to list two areas of interest or possible majors. These possible majors aren't binding and students don't declare their formal major until the end of their sophomore year. Something to remember when applying, when writing down these two um, areas of interest is that they're not binding, of course, and that they won't affect your application in any way because Brown doesn't doesn't have quotas for filling up their majors. So this is just this is just for them to have a reference. Brown will also accept supplemental materials if you have them, though they don't recommend them. They don't encourage them, but they don't discourage them. So if you want to send in like a YouTube link or an art or photography portfolio, then you can do that and they will, they won't take it in consideration extremely for your app admissions, but it will be considered a part of your application at least. For interviews, Brown will generally try to give every single applicant an interview. They do this through their alum volunteer network. So you don't have to apply for an interview or request one specifically. You will be contacted by an alum volunteer who will interview you. For your interview, your alum interviewee will not receive your application to Brown, only your intended area of study. However, Brown doesn't recommend bringing a resume or other materials to the interview. Sometimes applicants will not get the chance to be interviewed due to lack of interviewee av availability. In this case, keep in mind that even if you didn't get an interview, your application will not be negatively affected. So Brown is located in Providence, which is also home to the Rhode Island School of Design, or RISD. One of the things that my residential advisor, or RA, really stressed about Brown was that it's, one, it's commonly considered one of the least competitive and least stressful Ivy League schools. Brown's learning environment doesn't strive to be super cutthroat or competitive, and therefore its students are generally considered more happier or happier. Mm -hmm. Students in the dual degree program will naturally earn two degrees, a Bachelor of Arts from Brown and a Bachelor of Fine Arts from RISD. If you want to learn more about this dual degree program, then you can go to the link rizd.brown.edu. Most of student life is centered around Thayer Street, which is a street running through Providence that contains a lot of student hotspots, like the, um, there are convenience stores, cafes, and bookshops. Because Brown is a relatively small university, it focuses on making every single one of its classes small and personal so that each student receives a really complete learning experience. The class I attended was taught in a format that's common in a lot of Brown classes, which is the roundtable discussion style. This roundtable discussion style is a lot like what it sounds. Students will sit in a roundtable around the classroom and Generally, the lectures are kept to a minimum and student participation in like debates and student presentations are often more put put more highly are more highly valued than lectures. That's all for tonight. Thank you for listening.
Now, one thing that's really common in a lot of other very competitive colleges is the class curve. What the class curve is, is scaling each student's grade on a specific project, test, or presentation on the performance of the other students in a class. For example, if, one student, if the class average on a test is 50%, then a student who scores 75% would get an A, even though 75% is technically a C. One special thing about Brown is that it rarely has classes based on class curves like this, so students are more willing to reach out and help other students. This leads to a really low-key and non-competitive learning environment, so students really have the chance to, to just find help when they need it and learn to the best of their ability. Something else that attracts a lot of students to Brown is that there's a lot of research opportunities. My professor, Professor Shorrell, was a biology professor at Brown, and he told us that at Brown, it's common for even freshmen to participate in research in the Brown laboratories. Therefore, Brown and RISD have a dual degree program that lasts for five years, and basically what it is is for students who want a traditional education as well as an artistic one. For example, a lot of students may have, in the dual degree program, may choose to have a degree in both anthropology and in philosophy, and no, and in um, sculpture, for example. The RISD Brown dual degree program is very competitive. The acceptance rate is usually less than 5%, and what it takes to get in is being accepted into both Brown and RISD and then being accepted into the dual degree program by a separate application and separate deciding committee. Now, Providence is a very big city, so it's, it's commonly considered a really good college town because it's big enough that it offers a lot of student activities and just social interactions, but it's not too big uh, that it's unsafe for a college student to be living in. There's also a really big mall next to Brown, Brown's main campus called the Providence Mall, and it's a really it's a really big source of attraction for a lot of Brown students. There's also the Providence River, which is a river that runs through Providence. And every month, one of the biggest traditions at Brown is to watch the river, the water fire. Water fire is a is an art project that that happens every month. So. What they do is they light the braziers on the Providence River, and a lot of the Brown students will come out and watch it every single month, and many of them choose to take boat rides along the river while the lighting of the braziers happens. So as you can see, Brown has a very rich social life as well as a very, um, a very encouraging learning environment. And from my two weeks at Brown, I think that it's a really good fit for any kind of student. Brown is very academically and socially diverse, so it does feel like anyone could fit in at Brown. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle Lee and I'm a sophomore at Everything Valley High School. So today I'll be talking about MIT and I will divide my presentation into several sections, including an introduction, statistics, admission requirements, getting into MIT, student life, and after graduation statistics. So MIT, or the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, is a private research university in Cambridge, Massachusetts. MIT is traditionally known for its research and education in the physical sciences, engineering, and other STEM-related topics. In 2014, MIT's uh, undergraduate acceptance rate was 7.9%, and its graduate acceptance rate was 14.2%. So this makes MIT a very selective university. Forbes ranks MIT as the fifth best overall university in America, and U.S. News ranks MIT seventh. MIT is also number five in private colleges, number three in research universities, and number four in the Northeast. MIT's five most popular majors include engineering, which is chosen by 44%, computer science, which is chosen by 18%, physical science, which is chosen by 10%, Biological and Biomedical Sciences, 9%, and Mathematics, 6%. MIT requires that every applicant must take one or more of the SAT, ACT, or TOEFL, at least one SAT math subject test, 
and at least one science SAT subject test, which can be seen in the image I sent. Um, in terms of admission requirements, whether you apply for early action or regular action, MIT requires the following to be considered for admission. First, you need a biographical form, which includes personal information, such as your gender, your age, your ethnicity, and is not related to your academic achievements. Next are your essays, activities, and academics, and the materials for this portion are submitted online through a My MIT account. So MIT's application consists of several short answer questions and essays rather than one long essay. Activities include extracurricular such as speech and debate, robotics, school clubs, volunteer work, and other outside of school activities. The application's activity list provides space for five activities, but applicants are welcome to submit a supplemental resume in addition to filling out the activity list on the application. Next, you need two letters of recommendation, one which must be from a math or science teacher, in which potential subjects include math, biology, chemistry, physics, earth science, environmental science, computer science, engineering, technology, or science research. The other letter of recommendation must be from a language, social science, or humanities teacher, in which potential subjects include English, history, foreign language, classics, economics, government, psychology, social studies, or geography. You must also include a secondary school report, or SSR, which includes the applicant's high school grades transcript. Next are standardized testing results, which includes the SAT, ACT, or TOEFL, and two SAT subject tests. Last is the interview, and this portion of, of the application process is not required, but is recommended by MIT. In 2014, MIT admitted 10.8% of applicants who had an interview, but only 1% who did not have an interview. So it's definitely recommended to have the interview. MIT's undergraduate student statistics are pictured below. So for SAT reasoning test math, students score between 750 and 800. For SAT critical reading, students on average score between 690 and 790. For SAT writing, students also score between 690 and 790 on average. For ACT math, students generally score between 34 and 36. For ACT English, the average score was around 33 to 35. For the ACT composite score, the average was around 33 to 35 also. For SAT subject tests, math, the average score was between 770 and 800. And for science subject tests, the average score was between 740 and 800. According to MIT's website, MIT does not have a preference for the SAT or ACT, so it is recommended to take both tests and submit the better score. MIT also uses SuperScore for standardized tests, meaning that if you take the same test, like the SAT, ACT, or an SAT subject test multiple times, they will consider the highest score achieved in each section. So this is really helpful for you. MIT recommends that all applicants have at least a 3.5 GPA or above through all four years of high school. Competitive applicants also have A's in math and science courses, so it is your disadvantage if you have a B or lower in any STEM-related courses. I will attach an image showing the acceptance statuses of students with certain GPAs and standardized testing scores. There is no required number of APs to be admitted to MIT, but in general, the more APs a student takes, the better. However, it isn't beneficial to overload on AP classes so much that a student receives Bs or lower in a class or doesn't have time for extracurricular activities and competitions. The average number of AP classes taken by students admitted to MIT was between five and six for all four years of high school. So that averages around one to two per year. MIT also requires two letters of recommendation from teachers. One recommendation should be from a math or science teacher, as mentioned before, and the other one should be from a humanities, social science, or language teacher. 
you should definitely ask a teacher who has taught you in, in an academic class in high school. So it can't be from a middle school teacher or some, some other class that's not college pre preparation class, such as a basket weaving class. And ideally, um, the teacher who writes your recommendation should also know you more than just a student who does well in all the tests in the class. The best recommendations are generally written by teachers who know an applicant well as both a student and a person. In terms of the interview, MIT is interested in the whole person, which is why they offer an interview with a member of the MIT Education Council, a network of over 4,500 MIT graduates around the world who volunteer to meet with applicants in their home area. Interviews are strongly recommended because 10.8% of eligible, eligible applicants who had an interview or who had their interview waived were admitted, but only 1% who chose not to interview were admitted. In terms of extracurricular activities, um, note that because the college admissions process is highly subjective to each student, it's really unpredictable to tell which activities are best and which are not as good. But committing to extracurricular activities that align with your passion, whether it be speech and debate, business club, robotics, or any other activity, will make you a competitive applicant. It is also better to have quality in your extracurricular activities over quantity. And colleges also look for three things. One is leadership. So for example, it could be a club officer. Two is achievement. So you could win a competition. And three is community service. So to demonstrate that you're willing to give back to your community. So for summer activities, as with extracurricular activities, because the college admissions process is subjective and unpredictable, it is difficult to determine which summer activities are best. However, using your summer productively, such as internships, pre-college summer camps, volunteer projects, or any other activities that align with your passion will definitely make you a competitive applicant. Internships and pre-college summer, summer camps will most likely help with admissions because being selected for the internship or being accepted to the camp is very difficult and it shows colleges that you're a qualified and accomplished applicant. Volunteer projects that align with your passion show that you are committed to your passion and you're willing to give back to your community through service. So next I'll talk about student life at MIT. The people at MIT are all accomplished students, so there's lots of opportunity to make connections. There are over 510 student organizations at MIT, including seven media organizations, 72 ethnic and cultural associations, over 60 musical theater and dance groups, 21 activism groups, a regional ROTC program, and a lot more. MIT has 33 varsity sports teams ranging from track and field to soccer. MIT has 10 athletic facilities and 26 acres of playing fields, as well as a gym gymnasium. Outside of the formal extracurriculars and studies, MIT students are also known for the hacks, which are practical jokes played on the MIT community, such as putting a police car on the roof of one of the buildings. Next, I'll talk about after graduation statistics. So 21% of 2014 Bachelor degree graduates were found, found jobs through on-campus recruiting and MIT-sponsored job listings. 19% had internships that led to a full-time job offer. 19% found jobs through career fair. 18% found jobs through various networking venues, including MIT faculty and, and administrations, GECD contacts, and professional conferences. 78% of all graduating seniors completed internships while at MIT. Um, most of the information that I found was from MIT's websites, web.mit.edu and mitadmissions.org. This concludes my presentation about MIT. Thank you for listening. 57% of MIT undergraduates took jobs after graduation, of which 32% went on to graduate school. Some of the top graduate school's destinations were MIT, Harvard, Stanford, and UC Berkeley. The average starting salary for undergraduates is $74,980 per year.